All right, so hello and welcome. Today we're going to be reacting to the invasion of Poland by the Armchair Historian. I'll leave their link in the description. I believe you should go check them out. They have a lot of videos that are very good and detailed, um, especially for YouTube. It's quite actually unimaginable how they even can do it. Um, but yeah, so we'll try to talk about, or I will try to talk about anything related to Poland. It's not very much covered in United States history classes. Um, usually in high school, it's 1941 onward after Pearl Harbor, and you talk about it for five minutes and go past that. Um, but I'm a little bit more inform informed on the topic as much as you can be, so I'll try to add something. Um, otherwise, we'll just get straight to the video. In the suburbs of Warsaw, a veteran sits alone by the fireplace. The dying embers illuminate his stoic face, and the occasional flashes of light pierce the threadbare curtains covering the windows. He would be out there right now if he could. Sadly, the army has little use for maimed soldiers, even in situations as desperate as this. Having fought alongside the forces of the German Empire in the Great War, this veteran can scarcely believe that they are now coming to destroy his home. You're wondering why he said in the German art empire um, is because during World War One, Poland wasn't a country. Um, Poles served in the Austrian army, the German army, the Russian army, <laughs> um, because their state had been partitioned a good hundred so years beforehand. Um, so and they became free in 1919, I think. Yeah, 1919, 1918, if I remember correctly. If anybody is Polish and watching, you can uh, leave in the below, but they had to fight the Soviets after that, so. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. Today's video, the invasion of Poland from the Polish perspective. The rarely covered story of calamity and betrayal that started the Second World War. During the invasion, miscommunication within the Polish ranks led to many unnecessary casualties. Fortunately, data protection services like NordVPN ensure that you'll never need to worry about whether or not your orders are being transmitted safely. Indeed, NordVPN's military-grade encryption ensures that nothing gets in the way of a smooth internet experience. With 5,468 servers in 59 countries, NordVPN allows you to securely surf the web anywhere in the world on up to six devices. Oh, and you can watch television, movies, or even YouTube videos that are blocked in your country simply by connecting to a new server. Now, for a limited time, you can get a three-year plan plus one month for free for only $3.49 per month, which is 70% off when you sign up with the code HISTORY or follow the link in the description below. Born from the ashes of the Great War, Poland was a nation beset by enemies. The entire map of Eastern Europe had been redrawn after the war, and although Poland was the largest and strongest of these new countries, it was dwarfed by the superpowers on the horizon. To the west, there was Germany, frustrated by the Polish corridor cutting off its access to East Prussia. To the east, there was the Soviet Union, seething from its loss in the 1919-1920 Polish-Soviet War. Desperate to secure its future as a sovereign state, Poland entered into a defensive alliance with France in 1921. However, this distant ally offered scant protection against Soviet aggression, and Poland began investing heavily in its eastern defenses. It was only after Poland's foreign minister, Józef Beck, secured a non-aggression pact with the USSR in 1932 that tensions seemed to ease. Then the unthinkable happened. Germany, that supposedly humbled shell of a nation, suddenly burst back onto the scene. Led by Adolf Hitler's National Socialist Party, this resurgent and increasingly militant country now had its eyes dead set on the ethnically divided territories torn from it by the Treaty of Versailles. But one okay, let me let me pause here real quick. Um, I'll come back to this point. So, this right here is called the Free City of Danzig. It was technically an international zone. Um, most of my, well, some of my uh, base here uh, play Hearts of Iron Four. And this is considered Polish territory, but it really wasn't. Um, in Road to 56, you can play as Danzig. Um, but basically, they're an actual international city, um, and they're not under Polish control. Theoretically. 
Um, that's why Germany didn't like it, and they wanted to have a, a corridor, basically, so they could get to Prussia, because this is Prussia right here. Um, they wanted to be able to build a railhead. Now, of course, that was basically just an excuse to, I'm going to declare war on you. So, even if they gave it up, Germany probably would have still declared war on them. I mean, they gave them a false flag operation anyway, so it's not, like, above them. Um, also, this is a very key detail, actually. It's very nice. Um, this bag right here that you put on the side of your chest is actually a gas, a, a cape. A gas cape. Um, and it was issued to, and you'll see the guys in France and, thir and in 39 wear it like this. And then they basically put it in the the uh, gas canister after that. Um, so it's a pretty nice detail, actually. ...of her side. But once again, Beck stepped up to defuse the situation, wrangling another non-aggression pact from Germany in 1934. However, this house of cards came crashing down just a few years later, after Hitler seized the German ethnic Sudetenland in October in 1938, Poland used it as a precedent to annex Zaolzia, a Polish ethnic region in Czechoslovakia. Yes, they did. And there's an actual uh, movie on this that I think you should go watch. It's on Netflix. It's called um, Munich at War. And it's about the uh, Sudetenland right here. It's actually a pretty good movie. It's pretty accurate. Pretty accurate. I mean, there's things besides the main character. The main character is not really real, but yeah. This was a monumental blunder and caused both Britain and France, who saw the move as an act of aggression, to reconsider their support of Poland. Seeing an opportunity open up, Germany submitted a list of demands to Poland that included annexing the free city of Danzig and constructing an extraterritorial road and railway through the Polish corridor. See, they mentioned the free city of Danzig and it was a free city. Losing Danzig would have cut off Poland almost entirely from the sea, and a German railway could have later been used to justify the seizure of the entire corridor. Thus, Beck refused Hitler's demands, denouncing them as tantamount to a renunciation of Polish sovereignty. Beck also refused to negotiate with the increasingly belligerent Soviets and spent most of the next year campaigning for Western support in the event of hostilities, which he now saw as inevitable. As tensions escalated, plans were drawn up to defend against an attack from the North and West. However, they had to be immediately reworked after Germany completely annexed Czechoslovakia in March of 1939, which stretched the Polish-German border much further to the south. Suddenly, Poland had to worry about every point on the compass. Later that month, on March 31st, Poland formed a tentative military alliance with both Britain and France, with the former promising to support Poland's independence. By August 1939, Hitler was seeking any pretext to justify an invasion of Poland as panzers massed along the border. Marshal Edvard Ritz Schmigul, commander-in-chief of Poland's military, tried desperately to mobilize Polish forces. But his efforts were foiled by the UK and France, who insisted that the Polish offer no provocation to the Germans. And so their army sat idle until the 30th of August, when Ritz Schmigul finally ordered a general mobilization. Who knows what could, I mean, Poland was going down either way, let's be honest. You don't, you don't survive getting attacked by two superpowers on both sides. But if that mobilization order had actually come, a lot more, I think a few more divisions could have been mobilized. And France and Britain were just being stupid. They just refused to believe that this was actually happening. It was basically what was happening. Um, no provocation. Yeah. Um, Finland offered no provocation to the Soviets, and you saw what happened there. Poland offered no provocation to Germany and the Soviets, and you know what happened there. Denmark offered no provocation. Norway offered no provocation. Yeah, it, they're going to war anyway, so. Just one day after general mobilization was ordered in Poland, German troops dressed in Polish uniforms launched a series of false flag attacks against German military and civilian targets. Hitler furiously denounced these supposed Polish attacks in an evening radio broadcast that night, which he used to conceal his real intentions. War was inevitable. You don't know what a false flag operation is. Basically, it's... They get Polish uniforms and Polish weapons and stuff, okay? Then they attack their own country with, basically, they get dead bodies of whatever, uh, criminals or whatever. They use, they dress their bodies up in Polish uniforms and guns and whatever. Um, they attack, they say they attack German 
radio stations, shoot at their own radio stations, leave the dead bodies and say, oh, this is a false flag attack. You started it. Now we're going to war. And you all have to do is basically replace the uniform. And there you go. That's a false flag. Prior to this point, Polish generals had recognized the impossibility of a conventional defensive posture. Their strategy, named Plan West, was instead to delay German forces at the frontiers while falling back to a defensive line along the major rivers. There, they hoped to hold the line until their allies launched an invasion of Germany. The success of Plan West depended entirely on Britain and France upholding their guarantees. Poland's military strategists, headed by Marshal Ritz, did not think that their allies would simply sit back and watch them succumb to the Third Reich. Yet, there were- Yeah, and this is actually a very good plan, um, at least for Poland, right? You don't expect fucking France and England to sit on their ass and watch you die. Um, if they're going to be attacked, because they had no idea the Soviets were going No idea the Soviets were going to do it, but they kind of did. Um, this is a very good plan, right? You're going to just fight a delaying action um, and focus the German army here. Because the German armies can only be in one place one time. They either fight in Poland or they fight France. They're fighting Poland, then France can literally walk across the border. Um, they don't have a lot of guys there. And then Germany is forced to pull troops back, which relieves pressure on Poland so they can hold better and even push them back. But that's not what happened, obviously. And watch them succumb to the Third Reich. Yet, there were some, like Chief of the General Staff, Václav Stachewicz, who had doubts about the plan's feasibility. Inside the Polish headquarters in Warsaw, we can imagine a conversation like this taking place. Patrzyłem na te mapy godzinami, Ryc, ale fakty pozostają niezmienne. Plan operacyjny Zachód jest pełen wad. Doceniam twoją troskę, ale co możemy w tym momencie zmienić? Moglibyśmy skoncentrować nasze siły wzdłuż rzek, gdzie byłyby mniej narażone na otoczenie. To ułatwiłoby dostawy zaopatrzenia i polepszyło koordynację całej armii. Hmm, to ważne spostrzeżenie, ale cofając się tak daleko, odpuścilibyśmy ziemię zachodnie. Cały ten teren i jego populacja, zasoby, przemysł. Nie możemy pozwolić Niemcom zająć ich bez walki. Nie pozostanie nam nic do obrony, jeśli będziemy się trzymać tej strategii. Możliwe, ale musimy wytrzymać tylko do czasu, gdy sojusznicy przyjdą nam z pomocą. A co jeśli Brytyjczycy i Francuzi nie zaatakują? Zaatakują. Muszą. Jest zbyt późno, by zmieniać teraz kierunek naszych działań. Plan operacyjny Zachód jest naszą ostatnią nadzieją. At the outbreak of war, the Polish army had mobilized only about 500,000 men. Okay, so what they're talking about here is they can't change their plan. It's the same reason they couldn't change the sleeping plan. Each day, each of their plans, okay, France, Britain, and Germany, and even Austria, Hungary, and Russia, they each had mobilization day plans, right? 1 to 30. This is where you're supposed to be on day 1, this is where you're supposed to be on day 30, okay? They train all their troops for this exact plan. You can't just change it on a dime um, and flip-flop it. Uh, they didn't have time for that, um, and that would... Re take massive resources, logistics, officers, everything to change it. And they don't have time for that. So it's going to stick with what they got, which is Plan West. And again, not in theory a bad plan, as long as your allies actually did their, what their job was. Of which half were combat ready. Throughout the war, an additional 500,000 men would be raised, many of whom could have been mustered much earlier had the British and French not discouraged Polish mobilization. That would have been 1 million. So he's talking about the extra 500,000 at 1 million at the start of the war. It wouldn't have changed the outcome if everything went have still, you know, happened the way it did, but it could have delayed them a little bit longer. By September 1939, the army was organized into 26 infantry divisions, eight cavalry brigades, one motorized brigade, three mountain brigades, two armored brigades, and four independent tank battalions. The soldiers were reasonably motivated and disciplined, but they were poorly equipped due to Poland's relative poverty, with obsolete communication systems and a lack of motorized transport. Although, unlike what propaganda footage shows, the German army was not heavily motorized or mechanized either, and both sides relied heavily on horses. On the ground, Poland's latest tank was the 7TP, whose 37mm gun could easily knock out the Panzer I or Panzer II, and even destroy the Panzer IV. A 
Unfortunately, the 7TP was a rare sight on the battlefield. Only 161 were in service by 1939. 161 might seem like a lot, but that's actually not bad. Um, usually today, if we use NATO tank standards, it's four per platoon. Um, and there's usually three to four platoons in a company, but we'll go with three. Um, so that's like 16, 20 tanks in the platoon. That's not a lot. Um, tactically, that might be beneficial on tactical battle grounds, but operationally it wouldn't. A much more common sight was Poland's 575 TKS tankettes. While completely adorable, these tiny vehicles were barely more useful than armored cars and often less reliable. Lastly, the Poles had also purchased 88 tanks from their British and French allies. So, as it says here, unlike Germany, um, a lot of countries did this. France was one of them. France also did have tank um, brigades. I think they might have had a tank division um, under Charles de Gaulle, obviously. Um, but basically, it was concentration of forces. Um, Germany went with concentration of tanks. Everyone else kind of spread them out. Um, France was one of the really bad ones here that spread out their tanks a lot. Um, Poland, it says here, also did. Um, Britain actually had a pretty good tank corps um, because they had practice with it, basically. Now, again, all of these, these tanks are freaking obsolete as crap. Um, but again, they're also going only against like Panzer IIs and maybe some Panzer threes. They're not going against Panzer IVs at all, um, besides maybe a few with the close support gun variants, but mainly Panzer I, Panzer II, Panzer threes. Prior to the war. In the skies, the Polish Air Force had fewer than 400 modern aircraft. Poland's latest fighter, the P-24, was highly competitive with foreign planes when it was introduced in 1936, but it was outclassed by the time of the invasion. To make matters worse, Poland had exported many P-24s to other countries, leaving few for national defense. Thus, the Polish Air Force had to rely primarily on obsolete P-11s. Finally, at sea. So basically, their air force didn't exist, which, to be fair, they're going to lose against the superpower anyway at this point. The Polish Navy consisted of just five submarines and four destroyers, as well as various smaller vessels. Luckily, before the German attack, most destroyers retreated to England, while the submarines were ordered to mine the Polish coast around Danzig and interdict enemy ships attempting to stage amphibious landings. And uh, those destroyers actually did play a pivotal battle uh, part for the Polish Navy in uh, Britain because those crews, you can't replace those crews, right? Those are all pre-trained crews from the start of the war, not conscripts. Um, they're very good. Uh, E4 not, may, may not seem like a lot, but trust me, for the British, they needed every ship they could get. At 4.45 a.m. on September 1st, 1939, the German invasion began with the pre-dreadnought Schleswig-Holstein bombarding a military depot in Danzig. Warrant officer Władysław Baron recalled of the attack. The air rocked. Fountains of sand, stones, and smoke rose up. Shattered trunks and branches of trees, pieces of human bodies, and weapons flew in the air. So, the Schleswig Holstein is actually a World War I battleship. Pre dreadnought, it's not even a dreadnought, which is even before World War I, um, that Germany got to keep as a part of the Treaty of Versailles. So, basically, the only thing this thing can really do is shore bombardment. It can't fight anything. I um, mean, it's terribly outdated, but shore bombardment it can at least do something. Weapons flew in the air. As the sun rose, Marshal Ritz Schmiegel's worst fears were confirmed, as German armored spearheads punched straight through the confused Polish lines with barely a pause. Army Group North attacked the Polish corridor. Army Group South attacked Łódź, Krakow, and Warsaw, and forces from the German puppet state of Slovakia attacked Poland's southern regions. Lieutenant Jan Karski detailed his division's ordeal. The extent of death, destruction, and disorganization this combined fire caused in three short hours was incredible. By the time our wits were sufficiently collected even to survey the situation, it was apparent that we were in no position to offer any serious resistance. By the end of September 2nd, the Polish defenses had fallen apart. Nonetheless, some units resisted fiercely, especially the Polish cavalry brigades, considered the elite units of the Polish military. Far from charging into battle solely armed with sabers and lances, these modern cavalrymen also carried bolt-action rifles, anti-tank rifles, and machine guns, giving them access to some of the most concentrated firepower of the early war period. 
At the Battle of Mokra, the Wawinska Cavalry Brigade destroyed at least 50 German tanks and inflicted some 800 casualties in one of the only Polish victories of the war. When not fighting directly, the Polish cavalry acted as a mobile reserve, galloping to the front lines and then dismounting to fight as infantry. Polish armored trains also mounted... So I'll get, I'll talk about this cavalry thing a bit, okay? So yes, it's a propaganda thing that Poland, you know, charged tanks with cavalry. It's not what happened. So as they stated in the beginning, somewhere near the beginning of the video, they stated that Poland only had like one motorized brigade um, and a few tanks. And they had three cavalry, a, f a few cavalry brigades. Um, and these cavalry brigades were the elite of the elite uh, for infantry. So the most best modern term to think about them is like them being airborne infantry, at least on their training level. Um, because they, they have the traditions of the winged hussars, which are elite, um, and these are cavalrymen. Now, cavalrymen in 1939 are very, very deadly, and the reason is very simple. They can move faster, and they can carry things a lot, they can carry a lot more stuff than regular infantry guys can. Um, they have to pull everything on carts, right? And they're very fast um, for 1939, especially because Poland, again, was not a very economically uh, strong country. This has made sense. Um, and you give these guys, you know, anti-tank rifles, everything. An anti-tank rifle in 1939 would kill a tank, straight out. Um, you don't need a lot. And it is often mismemorized that Germany also had cavalry divisions. Um, France had cavalry. I think uh, Britain was the only country at this point that didn't have cavalry divisions. I don't think. Don't quote me on that. Um, but most of their army was motorized. Um, France may have had some cavalry divisions, but Germany had a lot of cavalry divisions. Um, so don't think that Germany had uh, uh, no cavalry. No, they had a lot of cavalry. ...mounted considerable resistance and wreaked havoc on enemy supply lines and communications, using the country's extensive rail network and forests for cover. Discounted by the Germans as obsolete, these self-sustaining behemoths, which came in light and heavy varieties, bristled with artillery pieces and machine guns. Overall, the 10 or so armored trains fought in about 90 battles during the invasion. 90 battles for 10 trains is amazing. That is amazingly... You use them a lot. Um, and it makes sense. Why? Because armored trains, even during the Soviet-Polish War, and even during the Soviet... Even during the Civil War, and even during World War One on the Eastern Front, um, armored trains were very effective. Now, their only limitation is basically they have to be on a rail track, but I mean, if they're coming to you, you know where you can deploy this thing. Um, and again, in 39, it's vulnerable, but it's not... Um, Let's just say it's not unkillable or like very vulnerable. It's vulnerable, but not extremely vulnerable. Varieties bristled with artillery pieces and machine guns. Overall, the 10 or so armored trains fought in about 90 battles during the invasion. On September 3rd, Britain and France finally declared war on Germany after repeated pleas from Polish diplomats. The Polish people were overjoyed with the news, but no military support was forthcoming. Polish forces continued losing ground on all fronts, and on September 5th, armies Krakow, Łódź, Prusa, and Poznan withdrew beyond the Vistula and Duniec rivers, abandoning western Poland. Unfortunately, the rivers had almost completely dried up due to drought, so they posed little obstacle to the German advance. To make matters worse, fleeing refugees clogged the roads, hampering efforts to contain the enemy breakthrough. Desperate for any assistance, Poland urged its allies to attack Germany's extremely weak Western Front. France responded by launching an offensive into the Tsar region of Germany on September 7th. Just now, as you can see, they outnumber the Germans 5-1 to one on this position. This is also where the Maggio line is. Um, and again, Germany doesn't have any people over here. Like, you could punch through and they couldn't stop you until they pulled forces from Poland. Which, again, the idea of Plan West was you know, that. Extremely weak Western Front, France responded by launching an offensive into the Tsar region of Germany on September 7th. Just as the Poles had hoped, early reports told of French making remarkable progress, capturing towns and overwhelming all German resistance. Once the British joined in, the Germans would have no choice but to divert forces to the west, and Poland would be saved. But then, on the 13th, the unthinkable occurred. The French, despite their crushing momentum, halted their advance. Days later, they pulled back to the relative safety of the Maginot Line. The news came like a slap in the face to the Poles. Without the help of their allies, Plan West was utterly ruined. One of the few bright spots in this otherwise dark time. Yeah, it was. At this point, it's over. 
uh, for Poland. They're going down. This is before the Soviets even attack. If France kept going, might have changed this. Time ...was the aerial defense of Warsaw. Between September 1st and the 6th, Polish fighters and anti-aircraft guns downed 80 German bombers and damaged more than 20 others. However, the situation deteriorated as the Germans escalated their bombing campaign. On September 10th, enemy bombers carried out 17 consecutive bombing raids, overwhelming the Polish defenses. Meanwhile, enemy tanks were closing in on the capital. The Poles were prepared for this, thanks to the effort of over 150,000 civilian volunteers who had labored for weeks to prepare a network of anti-tank ditches and improvised barricades, transforming Warsaw into a fortress. On September 8th, the Polish defenders watched with a mix of fear and steely resolve as German tanks appeared on the horizon. The attack began in the south as panzers overran several suburbs. But when the Germans attacked from the west, the Poles pushed them back from behind their makeshift barricades. When the Germans came again on the 9th with reinforcements in tow, the stubborn Poles repelled them again. Between these two assaults, the Poles destroyed 80 tanks and successfully denied the enemy further access to the western suburbs. As the battle raged on, the Poles made up for their shortage of anti-tank weapons with sheer ingenuity. For example, they covered a street with turpentine and lit it on fire when enemy tanks got close enough. Some Poles even lit mattresses on fire and hurled them onto the Germans from balconies. Could you imagine if Paris was like this and they actually fought on? <laughs> Yet everywhere around Warsaw, Poland's defenses were collapsing. On the 10th, Brits ordered a general retreat toward the Romanian bridgehead to relieve... Okay, so what do you mean the Romanian bridgehead is? Um, this is an agreement basically they had with Romania. It's basically, um, any forces that can get to Romania are given safe passage basically to France or the uh, West. Um, and it was very crucial that that happened because otherwise not a single Polish soldier would have made it out of there. Um, and that's not something Romania is, they were taught very much. Um, and it is something Romania did. And this was before Romania lost Transylvania and everything that happened to them. Army Łódź, armies Poznan and Pomorza counterattacked the left flank of the German forces attacking Warsaw between the 19th and the 15th. Although they were initially successful, low morale, poor coordination between units, and enemy air superiority turned the Battle of Zura into a crushing defeat, as the Germans encircled and destroyed them between the 15th and 19th. Polish defenses along the Narev River collapsed on the 12th, allowing the Germans to advance toward Warsaw from the east and lay siege to the city three days later. Combined with the survivors of the Battle of Zura, the defenders of Warsaw now numbered 140,000 soldiers. Opposing them were 175,000 Germans, supported by 1,000 artillery pieces and over 1,000 aircraft. For an entire week, the Poles endured a night and day bombardment as the Germans prepared to storm the city. However, on the 15th of September, the Warsaw garrison managed to repel all attacks on the Praga suburb and two full- I don't know how they- Manage that. That's that's impressive right there. Full scale attacks on the 23rd and 26th. As the siege continued, strange reports began arriving from the east. Soviet forces were pouring across the border, and the Germans were retreating before them. To the beleaguered defenders of Lvov, this meant salvation. After enduring a grueling siege by German forces, the city opened its gates to the Red Army without hesitation. But even as Polish citizens prepared to celebrate with their unlikely saviors, the horrible truth was revealed. The Soviets were not here to help, but merely to take their share of the spoils. It was at this point that the Polish High Command lost confidence in the defense of the country, so it fled to the border of Romania, to the small town of Kudy. Abandoned by their leadership, the remaining Polish forces had no idea how to react to the Soviet invasion. Some units continued fighting, but they could not stop the twin juggernauts from squeezing the life out of Poland. On September 27th, after three weeks of... Look at that. 10% of all buildings in Warsaw were gone. 
forty percent even more on top of that, we're heavily damaged in the fighting. And they turn Poland into basically or Warsaw into rubble. Staunch resistance, the Warsaw garrison finally surrendered in the face of the near complete destruction of the city. All they had to do was threaten Paris that they were going to be there. One later wrote, We listened silently to these grim words. There were no questions or comments. Our minds recognized the inevitability of capitulation, but our feelings could not be reconciled to it. Was this to be the end? Fighting continued on October 6th as the Germans and Soviets eliminated the last pockets of resistance. The brave but unsuccessful defense of Poland came at a steep price. Poland sustained between 880,000 and 1,253,000 casualties. Germany sustained between 44,000. That's mind boggling for a few weeks of combat 800,000 to 1.2 million and 51,400, and the USSR between 3,800 and 13,000 during the invasion. Nevertheless, about 100,000 Polish soldiers managed to escape, and they would go on to join the Allied war effort, seeing action throughout the remainder of the Second World War. In November 1939, the Polish government in exile announced that it would fight for the restoration of Poland. Despite their resentment towards Britain and France for failing to come to their aid in the invasion, they agreed to cooperate with them and organize a resistance movement within their occupied country. This culminated in the heroic but doomed Warsaw Uprising, a fascinating topic for a future video. Despite their devastating loss in the invasion, the fight for Poland was far from over. And yeah, the Warsaw Uprising is one of those events that really should be covered a lot. Um... Is basically Poland's last attempt to break themselves out um, before they basically the Soviets got there and would take them over and be communist. And they gave it their they gave it their all, and the Soviets let them die. Basically, is what happened. All right, so that's the end of the video. Um, very good, very good um, video from Armchair Historian. Um, so those are my thoughts. Um, yeah, Poland was basically left out to dry by the Western Allies, and even after, and even after World War II, they they realized they're like, there's no way we're getting to Poland. They're just done. Um, so those exiles that lived in, that fought for the Western Allies, they they couldn't return to Poland because if they did, they'd be shot um, for what they did. So, all right. Uh, hope you guys liked that reaction. Uh, let me know down in the comments below if you did. Leave some comments uh, from your perspective about this video. Otherwise, I shall see you people next time.